Hi, my name is John Landy. I'm a retired professor at the University of Missouri Law School, and I am doing this video for law students to explain why they should call it negotiation school, not law school. So I'm going to talk about the wrong end of the telescope view in legal education, why law schools focus on only a small part of legal practice and miss the larger part, problems with traditional negotiation theory, alternative theoretical tools to traditional negotiation theory that may help you in law school and in practice, and some tips for practice, as well as some practical resources for further learning. You will get a copy of the PowerPoint, so you don't have to take notes, and the PowerPoint has uh, all sorts of links you may want to follow. So, do you want to know a secret? Here's a secret. Every law school's hidden curriculum is misleading. Every law school. And what do we mean by a hidden curriculum? That's a term used by educational experts to talk about implicit messages that are sent uh, that are very powerful. So what's the hidden curriculum? in law school. Well, part of it is that legal rules are the most important factors in disputes. That's what you're studying all the time in your courts is legal rules. In most cases are decided by appellate courts. You're reading all these appellate case reports that suggest that that's really where the action is and that's really what's most important. And thinking like a lawyer is predicting court decisions. That's what you do in your classes. You're going to read cases and Think about why the courts decided as they did and your professors are going to give you hypos and you're going to try and figure out what the courts would decide in those cases. And winning is the only or most important thing. That's the idea is you want to figure out what the right decision is in court and so you can win for your client and for your own glory. And it's all about the money. That's what clients are concerned about aside from winning. And lawyers and clients have the same perspectives because Clients are mostly invisible bystanders in their cases, and lawyers are going to simply represent their clients' views accurately. And negotiation is trivial. It's barely worth mentioning in law school courses. Well, do you want to know the truth? Can you handle the truth? Well, the truth is that legal rules often are not the most important factor in resolving disputes. This link is a link to a Article, an article by a magistrate judge who has settled thousands of disputes and he describes how many other factors are more important than resolving disputes. Most cases are not decided by appellate courts or even trial courts. Thinking like a lawyer is focusing on clients interests. It's not about predicting what the court will do. That's an important part of what lawyers job is, but the first order of business is identifying what your client's interests are and trying to advance them. And winning is often not the most important goal for clients. Sometimes it's not losing, which is not the same thing as winning. And they have many other goals, which we'll talk about. And it's not all about the money in many cases. Often the clients have many, many, many other non-monetary interests, which lawyers often don't pay enough attention to, but are very important for clients. And one reason that clients are often unhappy with their lawyers. You don't want your clients to be unhappy with you, do you? And part of that is that lawyers and clients have very different perspectives, often because they're focused on different things, they have different priorities. And clients are the central actors in lawyers' work. In private practice, clients are the ones who pay lawyers' bills. And lawyers are concerned, personally and professionally and ethically, that their job is to help their clients. That's their first job. And lawyers negotiate all the time, much more than appearing in court. And this is part of that hidden curriculum. Negotiation is, is mostly absent in your law school classes, and yet it happens so much more than lawyers appearing in court. And in fact, trial is the real alternative dispute resolution. In the federal courts, only about 1% of lawsuits go to trial. In state courts, somewhat more, but still a relatively small proportion of cases. Here's a quote by two respected academics. 
said tried cases are typically high risk, all or nothing cases, cases with unusual facts or intransigent parties, cases that defy compromise. Their outcomes by comparison with ordinary workaday settlement cases are costly, unpredictable, and sometimes bizarre. Because jury trials and jury verdicts are the most visible products of litigation, these extreme and unrepresentative cases distort public perception of the administration of civil justice. So the cases that go to trial, let alone those that go up on appeal, are unusual, they're bizarre, they're freaks, in the words of one of these authors. And only a fraction of tried cases are appealed, and of those, only a fraction of those are decided with a written opinion. So what you are focusing on in your law school classes is a very unrepresentative part of the legal justice system. So why do I tell you all this and how can you use this information? It provides context and can help you navigate through your law school classes. You should recognize that litigation is essential. It provides many, many, many valuable functions in our society, starting with structuring democracy and protecting rights and uh, enabling transactions, but it's also very problematic. It is very costly and it promotes adversarial dynamics. So as you read cases in your courses, imagine what was really going on between the parties. And since so few cases go to trial or appealed, what was different about the cases that you read in your courses? And why did lawyers make conflicting arguments? Isn't the law so clear? And why are lower court judges reversed? Are they stupid? Well, the answer is that they're generally not stupid and lawyers are generally not stupid. So why do we have these conflicting arguments and why did some cases have the court opinions get reversed? I want to tell you about a study that just came out that found that new lawyers are woefully unprepared. It's a study done by Ohio State Professor Deborah Jones Merritt in cooperation with the Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System. And they did 50 focus groups with new lawyers and lawyers who, uh, who uh, supervise new lawyers. And here are some quotes from the study. The number one complaint of clients of lawyers is lack of communication or poor communication are not being told what the hell is going on in their case. And this is a major source of disciplinary complaints about clients. So when you are in practice, be sure to communicate well with your clients. Um, this you have, it's your ethical duty and it's in your self interest. Another lawyer said, somebody can know the black letter law inside and out. And then on their first day on the job, they're sitting in front of somebody who's incredibly worried, incredibly anxious, and you have no clue what to do. Your law school classes generally don't teach you about this, but this is really important. Now, the lawyer said, sometimes we don't ask the client, well, what does victory look like? What's your goal here? This is a central aspect of lawyers' job is to identify what the client's objectives are and to do your best to try and advance them. A lawyer who supervised New lawyers said failure to understand the big picture created difficulty developing strategies to guide client matters. These new lawyers knew the rules, but they didn't know how to combine the rules into a successful strategy. And unfortunately, law school generally doesn't teach you how to do that. It teaches you all these pieces, teaches you the rules of the game. It doesn't teach you how to see the big picture or to know how to play the game. I don't mean game in a trivial way, but know how to work in the system. And the study recommends that students take three credits to develop the ability to work with clients and three credits to develop no negotiation skills. So what is negotiation? Lots of different definitions, no consensus. My definition is it's a process of seeking agreement about a course of action. And unlike some definitions, this doesn't require that there's been a dispute. I mean, there are negotiations over developing deals and transactions doesn't require that there's necessarily an exchange of offers, that there's legal consideration or quid pro quo that you learn about in contracts, doesn't require the goal of forming a legal contract. And instead of using these elements in a definition, you can use them to describe different negotiations. You can describe 
those negotiations that are about disputes or transactions, or those negotiations that involve an exchange of offers or that don't, those negotiations that involve legal consideration or don't. And lawyers negotiate in every type of practice, in civil and criminal cases. In criminal cases, they, plea bargaining is the main way that cases are settled. And of course, as I mentioned, in civil cases, only a small fraction of cases go to trial. In appellate litigation, you'd be surprised perhaps that there's a lot of negotiation going on. All the federal circuit courts have mediation programs to try and settle cases. And of course, lawyers and parties can settle cases while they're pending on appeal, and they do. Obviously, there's negotiation in transactions. There's in administrative law when entities and individuals are dealing with the government, there's negotiation and in internal organizational matters, corporate lawyers dealing with internal corporate matters deal with negotiation with all sorts of internal stakeholders. I note here that I have links to blog posts about negotiation in criminal and transactional matters you may wanna take a look at. So negotiators, lawyers negotiate all the time and people often think of negotiation only as a process with a counterpart lawyer at the final stage of a, of a case, but that's, a very small fraction. In fact, lawyers also negotiate throughout cases with clients, with supervisors, with co-workers, with experts, with court reporters, with private dispute resolution professionals, and even with judges. So this negotiation, don't think of it as just this tail end of a process in a case or a transaction with a counterpart lawyer. So let me give you some examples. Lawyers negotiate with clients about fee arrangements and the scope of their work. Lawyers negotiate with counterpart lawyers all the time about extension of deadlines or res resolution of discovery disputes. Lawyers negotiate with supervisors about what arguments to include in a brief. They negotiate with coworkers about what to order for lunch, with experts about the content of opinion letters, with court reporters about scheduling, with mediators about what materials to provide for mediation, and even with judges about discovery schedules. So lawyers negotiate all the time with lots of different people. So here's a link with more examples of negotiation. Now here's where I'm gonna tell you about the traditional negotiation models, which are problematic. There are two main models in traditional negotiation theory, which is very confusing and misleading, and they go by different names. Um, two of the names are serial positional, sometimes called distributive negotiation. This is where parties try and maximize advantage, starting with extreme positions. So each side starts with an extreme position. A plaintiff may ask for a million dollars. The defendant may offer $10,000, and then they make a series of concessions back and forth, trying to get the most favorable uh, agreement for themselves. A second approach is a cooperative or interest-based or integrative negotiation where parties try to satisfy all parties by identifying the interests of all parties and then identifying options for satisfying parties' interests and then trying to come up with a solution that's gonna satisfy everybody's interests. Now there's a missing model that doesn't show up in traditional negotiation theory. It ignores the most common pattern or ache uh, a very common pattern, and probably the most common pattern, which I call ordinary legal negotiation or norm-based negotiation. Negotiators start with generally accepted norms and argue for ad advantageous modifications. So in criminal law, this is the normal way to plea bargain. There's a standard deal or going rates. The prosecutors and defense counsel or experience know what those standard deals are. Those are the starting points for negotiation and the lawyers will try and negotiate up or down based on uh, aggravating or mitigating circumstances. Uh, in child support negotiations, the law provides for a presumptive amount of child support, but then the parents may negotiate for higher or lower amounts based on that. In parenting schedules and workers comp cases and contract cases and uh, some tort cases, this model starting with these norms, what the standard deals are, what the going rates are, this is the starting point for negotiation. 
And it's one of the ways that people negotiate. And so here's a, a link with more information about these negotiation models, as well as the variables discussed in this very slide. So negotiation models assume the key variables are bundled together. And my research shows that that's often not so. And instead of models, I suggest that people focus on the variables that comprise the models. So for example, some models vary about whether the parties are concerned about the other side's interests. In some cases they are, in some cases they aren't. Whether they use counter offers or some other process to negotiate. Whether they seek to create value or claim value. That is, whether they're looking for something where both sides are better off or whether it's a zero sum where each side assumes that one person's gain is the other's loss. Do they use a hostile or friendly tone? Do they try and use power to get their way? Do they use law or other norms as a basis for argument? So you can unbundle these models and mix and match uh, these variables, which vary over time. So not only do you not have these bundled models that describe entire negotiations, but you have these variables that themselves will vary over time in a given case. So my co-authors and I wrote this book called Litigation Interest and in Risk Assessment, Help Your Clients Make Good Litigation Decisions. It, this, it develops a three-part structure to develop the bottom line for settlement. So the first part is the expected value of the court outcome, probably familiar with the term BATNA, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. So the expected value of a court outcome in litigation is the, uh, what you expect to happen in court. The second element is, are the tangible course of costs of continuing to litigate? And the third element are the intangible costs of continuing to litigate. And the goals for this process is to improve party decision-making. As I mentioned, lawyers have a fundamental ethical obligation to provide information to enable parties to set their own goals and objectives for the representation and to decide whether to settle or not. So this is a central obligation of lawyers and this LIRA system is designed to help lawyers do that. And it's designed to help improve the results for parties, for courts and society by reducing what researchers call decision errors in going to trial after rejecting a good settlement offer. It is mind boggling that several studies have found that approximately 85%, give or take, of cases going to trial in 85% of these cases, one side or the other gets a worse result than the other side's last offer. So imagine this, imagine you're representing a plaintiff. The defendant has offered $100,000 to settle the case and your client, you, you end up going to trial and your client only gets a $50,000 judgment at trial. This is a horrible result, a horrible result. Your client is $50,000 worse off. He or she has spent all the extra time and money and effort and anxiety in going to trial. And not only that, probably they're not happy with you for going to trial instead of accepting that settlement offer. And this is true also for defendants. They may have gotten a demand for $100,000 and they may find that they're facing a judgment of a million dollars. And although defendants um, make these decision errors less frequently than plaintiffs, according to this research, when they do, they're doozies. And the average amount of the error is over a million dollars. And one of the problems with these decision errors is that they are costly to uh, courts, which have very limited resources and courts are very important elements of society. So avoiding these bad decisions, these wasteful trials is an important part of what this LIRA system is designed to do. And part of that is by reducing tangible and intangible costs of litigation. So what are some of the common sources of conflict? It's about relationships. People aren't getting along and they decide they're gonna fight over something that if they were getting along, they wouldn't fight about. They don't trust each other. Poor communication. They're afraid of looking weak and losing, losing face, losing money. They're concerned about setting precedents. 
Lawyers sometimes want to perform for clients and increase fees, and that perpetuates conflict or increases or stimulates conflict. And sometimes people have unrealistic expectations about the trial outcome. Often people focus on this last one, the unrealistic expectations about the trial outcome, as if that's the only or main source of conflict. And sometimes it is, but often it isn't. And you should not assume that it necessarily is. So what's, what are some of the benefits of using this system? You can help clients understand their interest in litigation risks, identify key legal and factual uncertainties, estimate possible outcomes, and then develop bottom lines. And it involves explicitly considering tangible and intangible costs, things that lawyers often don't do. And by doing this, you can help clients develop effective and wise strategies for litigation, negotiation, and mediation. So what are some of these intangible costs of litigation? Litigation imposes really serious intangible costs on parties which often are overlooked or undervalued. One of the major ones is litigation stress, which can literally cause physical and psychological harm. Another one are feelings of unfairness and disrespect and victimization. It's not a fun experience to be a litigant where the other side is attacking you and attacking you in a way that's unfair, you feel, that's disrespectful, and that makes you feel like a victim. Being in litigation often has people feeling that they're stuck, they're not getting on with their life or their business. It damages relationships, it harms reputations, and it causes loss of opportunities. People are investing time and money and effort in litigation that they could be investing in all sorts of other things, including just relaxing, going on vacation. So how do you negotiate more successfully? It's important to develop good relationships with clients and counterpart lawyers. In practice, the key tasks are to develop these relationships. And as I mentioned at the outset, lawyers and clients often have very different perspectives and it takes careful work by lawyers to get on the same wavelength with their clients. Also, lawyers' relationships with their counterparts generally have a major impact on how cases work out. You can talk to lawyers who will tell you if they know who the lawyer is on the other side of the case, they can tell you how it's going to turn out. If you're dealing with a bulldog on the other side of the case, it's going to be a problem. If you're dealing with someone who's reasonable, things are going to go a lot more smoothly. So having knowing about the relationship with your counterpart lawyer is critical. So what should you do? With your clients, you want to learn about their interests and priorities, which may include the financial outcome, winning or beating the other side or not losing, which is not the same as winning, getting rid of the dispute, getting on with life and business, getting respect and apology, and lots of other things. There's a whole long list of things that clients may be interested in. It's your job is to figure out what that is. Some of the things you can't satisfy and you may need to explain that to them. Some of them you may be able to arrange, but you need to figure out what the client's interests and priorities are. And then my strong advice is at the outset of a case, try and develop a good relationship with your counterpart lawyer. Here's a link to an article that describes ways to do that. And as I said, if you have a good relationship, the case will be a lot easier. If they aren't interested, life will be your own private hell and you're gonna to need to be on guard to see what the other side is gonna to do to try and uh, harm your case and harm your client's interests. So what do you need to do? You need to prepare wisely Make your best estimates of the expected court outcome. This is what we teach you in law school to identify key factual and legal uncertainties. Conduct discovery and legal research to reduce those uncertainties. Recognize a range of possible outcomes. One of the things is that litigation is entirely uncertain. If you tried the same case 100 times, you would not get the same result 100 times. You get results that would look like a normal distribution curve, a bell curve. They'd be centered around the average, but you'd have a range of outcomes above and below the average. And depending on the uncertainties, you could have a very wide range. So part of it is to try and figure out what that distribution of possible outcomes is likely to be. And then you wanna also make realistic estimates of future 
legal fees and costs of going to trial. These are the tangible costs and they help clients identify and value their intangible interests. Now the, the tangible costs, you can put a clearly a dollar value on how much the legal fees are and how much you have to pay for experts and things like that. The intangible interests, such as how much stress is worth or how much vindication is worth or all sorts of other things are inherently subjective and there is no objective measure and your job is to help your clients put their own value on it. So getting an apology may be worth a certain amount for one party and another amount for another party. So your job is to help figure out and help your clients figure out what these interests are worth to them. And then develop a bottom line by incorporating all of these things, the expected court outcome and the anticipated tangible and intangible costs. So for example, if you have a, expect a, you're representing a plaintiff and you expect a $100,000 uh, is a is the expected court outcome and you value or your client values the tangible and intangible costs at $20,000, then their bottom line would be $80,000. They would be better off by accepting anything over $80,000 um, to settle because they value their tangible and intangible costs as $20,000. And based on all this, you develop your negotiation strategy, considering the negotiation models and especially the variables that I described earlier. Now, in the new normal after the COVID pandemic, people are going to continue to use video even after they feel safe in meeting, meeting in person. So you'll be using video, which at this point you're probably already familiar with. And indeed, the fact that you're watching this is a reflection of that. Professionals and many lay people will be comfortable with using video and appreciate its efficiency. Part of your job as lawyers, you'll need patience in dealing with communication problems and extra time, especially time to talk with clients and deal with technology problems. And one of the things you can do is break negotiation and mediation into stages because you don't have to worry about the hassle and time and logistics of travel. It's easier to do that, to break the process into stages. So you're going to maybe in competitions in law school, what should you do? Your goal always is to protect your client's interests. Often there's a suggestion that you should try and be cooperative in negotiation and mediation. Indeed, you often should, but only in the interest of protecting your client's interests. Cooperation is a means to an end. It's not the end in itself. The end in itself is protecting your client's interests. Recognize that judges have different philosophies. So you may learn in your course about these different models and approaches to mediation, and you can't assume that any given judge will have one philosophy or another. So your goal is to try and achieve the goals of multiple models. In particular, I suggest using a tit for tat approach, start off cooperatively and then mirror the counterparts responses, either cooperative or adversarial. If you start off cooperatively and the other side is cooperative, continue being cooperative. If the other side decides to be adversarial. You want to show them that you can't get pushed around and you want to be firm and not let your client's interests be sacrificed, but also indicate that you're willing to cooperate if they are going forward. If appropriate, you can offer them the easy way or the hard way. You can say that you prefer the easy way, but you can do it the hard way if they want. Don't say, I've seen so many of my students say, don't say, my goal is to reach settlement today. No, no, no. That suggests that settlement is the most important thing. You should say, my goal is to reach settlement if we can satisfy both sides' interests. Now, of course, you're really interested in your client's interests, but if you just say that, then that's going to turn off the other side. So the goal is to, the, the point is you want to be clear that your priority is satisfying your client's interests. So here are a bunch of resources. Article, wonderful article by Clark Cunningham, where he summarizes lots of studies about how clients are really unhappy with their lawyers is a nice way of putting it. Uh, one lawyer, one client described his client as being a total waste of space. Um, lots of clients are unhappy with their client, with their lawyers 
and you do not want that to happen to you when you're in practice. Great book by Marjorie Corman Aaron called Client Science Advice for, Advi for Lawyers and Counseling Clients Through Bad News and Other Realities. The bad news is that you're gonna to have to give bad news to clients a lot, and that's hard and it's not fun. And this book gives advice based on empirical research about how to do that most effectively. Next is an article that I wrote about good pretrial lawyering, planning to get to yes, sooner, cheaper, and better. And it's based on interviews I did with uh, lawyers about cases they recently settled. Another article I wrote is some general advice, my last lecture. I wrote a book entitled Lawyering with Planned Early Negotiation, How You Can Get Good Results for Clients and Make Money, Two Major Interests of Lawyers. And then here are some posts um, about Lyra and my, the Indisputably blog, and then my email if you want to email me or talk by Zoom. Finally, let me just mention you can join the ABA for free. You can click here to join the law student division. And not only can you join the ABA for free, but you can join several sections for free, which enables you to get publications and resources at a discount, as well as valuable networking opportunities. I've been part of the section of dispute resolution for a long time, which is terrific. Uh, the Lyra book probably is in your library. And if you want to get your own copy, you can get a 25 uh, percent discount uh, using the code uh, 25LIRRA. And with that, I'm going to end and wish you a very successful career in law school and in practice.